Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, and welcome to Global Insights, a live interactive panel discussion which sheds light on big questions facing researchers, policymakers, and planners worldwide. Global Insights features experts from leading institutions in the study of international affairs, including the Balsillie School in Canada, the University of Warwick in the UK, American University in the United States, and our other partners. Today's live streamed production is entitled Brexit and the Future of Europe. My name is Scott Hamilton. I'm the research coordinator at the Balsillie School, and I'm delighted to serve as moderator for today's session. A warm welcome to all participants joining us today in the audience. We would invite you to direct any questions for our panelists using the Q&A function of your Zoom page, and we'll do our best to put your questions back to the panelists, particularly in the latter half of today's session. Before we begin, I'd like to begin uh, with a land acknowledgement. So for those in the audience who are tuning in from outside Canada, one of the actions we take to advance reconciliation between settler and indigenous peoples is to reflect on our relationship with the land and the continuous process of colonization that deeply impacts our work. Acknowledging the land is the process of deliberately naming that this is indigenous land and that indigenous people have rights to this land. The Balsillie School of International Affairs is situated on the Haldeman Tract, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River, which is on the traditional territory of the Atawandaran, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee peoples. It is particularly important that we here at the school acknowledge the land upon which we are situated in everything that we do, including Global Insights. So to start us off on today's conversation, let's turn to our distinguished panel. Oslem Atashan is an associate professor at the University of Warwick and a visiting senior research fellow at the University College London. Her research combines a theoretical focus on issue framing, the politicization of trade agreements, and diffusion with a regional focus on the European Union. She is leading an open research area grant, ORA 2021-2014, studying emergence and global diffusion of frames, which involves both qualitative and quantitative methods. Jörg Groshek is Canada Research Chair Tier 2 in Comparative Federalism and Multilevel Governance and Associate Professor of Political Science at Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo. He is a fellow at the Balsillie School and his research focuses on comparative federalism and multilevel politics, the patterns and implications of change in federations and regionalized states, and the role of municipalities and supra or international organizations. Michelle Egan is professor in the School of International Service at American University and a global fellow at the Wilson Center. She has held a number of fellowships and been a Council of Foreign Relations Fellow in Canada and is also a Warwick alum. She is currently working on two books, one on EU contestation and polarization and one on trade and federalism in Canada. Dirk Leufen is a professor of political science and international politics at the Department of Politics and Public Administration at Constance University. His research interests include the study of differentiated European integration, decision making in the European Union, and more generally, the interplay between domestic and international politics. So thank you once again, everyone, for being with us today and sharing your insights on this important topic. So with Brexit. I think it's fair to say that the last decade or so has been somewhat difficult for Europe. Uh, from the global financial crisis of 2008-2009, the refugee and migrant crisis of 2015, to Brexit and the rise of populism in a number of countries on the continent, and now, of course, COVID-19, well, these have all exposed cracks in the project of integration. I think it's fair to ask whether 2021 is a watershed moment in the history of both the UK and Europe. So Jörg, turning to you first, is Brexit an historical accident or was it something probable? I would say it was both. There, there are accidental log logics at play, but there are also structural logics at play. I mean, we live in a, in a period where history is quite open and small, small accidental events can obviously have a large impact. So if I think about like uh, how the, the whole Brexit referendum came into existence, the poor leadership, the outcome itself, with, uh, which was pretty tight, this is pretty accidental somehow. On the other hand, there are also larger structural forces at work. Uh, people in the field call it like a reconfiguration of multi-level governance more general, where you have on the one hand, 
increasing pressure to allocate functions at the European Union level or even on the, on the international level to tackle them effectively. On the other hand, the desire of communities to, to reclaim self-rule again and, and be more autonomous in many respects. So this is the largest structural field, I think, where we have to situate Brexit. And this materializes or has materialized in the relationship between the EU and the UK in certain frictions between institutions, institutional realities and ideas, most notably the constitutionalization of the EU versus the Westminster democracy and a common law tradition. And that has certainly uh, created pressure. However, I would not say that Brexit was inevitably an accident in the making. There would have been other options as well. And uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about Canada later uh, in this respect. Uh, I, I think there were different scenarios available, and one was the Brexit, Bre Brexit outcome. Now, when you speak about reconfiguration of governance and pressure, that takes us to the future prospects for the union. Uh, so, Michelle, turning to you, let's look at post-Brexit, uh, especially when considering calls for Scottish independence and Irish unification. What are the prospects for the union? That's interesting, because... Five years on, you know, it remains deeply divisive within the United Kingdom because Northern Ireland and Scotland voted to remain. And the one thing to think about, people are talking now about, you know, what's going to happen to the breakup of Britain. And I think constitutionally, there are two different things. For Scotland, it would be independence, and for Northern Ireland, it would be unification. So it would be two different processes. And Scotland had a referendum in 2014, and that was billed as a once in a generation referendum. Well, of course, that was pre Brexit. And so now we're looking for, and people should be really looking at the electoral results of the Scottish Parliament in May 2021, um, it, because the Scottish Nationalist Party is going to be the big party. Now they're going to make the dominant electoral gains. And Johnson has already said very specifically as British Prime Minister, another you know, referendum for independence for Scotland is uncalled for and unnecessary. And the question becomes for Scotland, it's a lot more murky because the legality of whether you can call a referendum, it's contingent on the British Parliament um, providing that. It has to come, you know, it has to be, you know, given to them. And even if they hold an advisory referendum, it would probably be challenged in the court. They don't want to go down the Catalonia path, so to speak. Northern Ireland is very different. And Northern Ireland is governed and has a much more formalized process. If the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, the Northern Irish minister, decides that there is going to be an opportunity to do so, they will uh, call for a border poll between North and South. Very different processes. Thank you. So when you talk about uh, division and referendums, you're obviously talking a lot about communication and public opinion. Uh, and I know, Oslem, your work is on the impact of political language on public opinion. So how do communication strategies really affect the way we think about complex political issues such as the European integration project? Yes, thank you very much. That's a very interesting question. In my work, I study this phenomenon called framing. And framing is the process where a speaker can emphasize and de-emphasize certain aspects of the issue and cause shifts in public opinion. So the way an issue is presented can produce dramatic differences in public opinion. And in the classical example from the US, respondents are asked whether they would favor or oppose allowing a hate group to hold a political rally. And interestingly, 85% of respondents answer in favor if the question highlights the importance of free speech, but only 45% are in favor when the question emphasizes public safety or risk of violence. And to apply all of this to the EU, the European Union is a very complex and technical entity, and it's quite remote from the daily lives of European citizens. And this is why it's quite susceptible to such framing effects. And a lot depends on how national politicians present the EU to the public and which aspect of this quite large and complex integration project they bring to the spotlight. And importantly, not every argument is equally effective. A frame or an argument is strong if it taps into topics that the public is familiar with, if it's emotional and if it's negative. That's how our brains are wired. 
But I need to clarify a very important point here. When we talk about effective or strong frames, we do, we do not mean this with empirical validity or truth on our mind. An argument can be misleading or inaccurate, but it can have an impact of, on public opinion if it makes an emotional case on a familiar topic. In that sense, what I mean by the strength of an argument is really the strength of its public appeal. Um, so that's the really underlying mechanism of post-truth politics and these are the um, kinds of dynamics I study in my work. Thank you. And so when you talk about framing, there's a bit of a, a background image or hue um, framing everything that has not come up yet, but of course we have to mention it, uh, which is the ongoing global pandemic. Uh, so Dirk, what has the COVID-19 experience taught you about this situation uh, and about the EU? Scott, um, you are probably too young, but there was a film in the 1990s called uh, Reality Bites. And I, I always think of this film when I think of the EU um, during COVID. Um, initially, we saw big uh, national reflexes. There were border closures, um, uncoordinated, although the, the crisis didn't pop up from one day to the next, but it was sort of a, a rapid increase, but uh, still there was some time. But um, so there were national reflexes. And uh, that again reminded us uh, that we still uh, live in national health and political realities. However, the bigger reality is actually interdependence and the social reality of people moving across borders, um, uh, goods uh, being shipped across borders, etc. And um, in April to May 2020, we can diagnose a shift in what was going on in EU politics. And um, so interdependence was suddenly met with a political leadership, um, in particular, I would say, with the, the German um, Council presidency. That that enabled um, the um, Pandemic Recovery Fund called Next Generation EU. And we saw that there's a, um, a continuous decision to um, um, procure the vaccinations, um, the, the vaccines um, uh, commonly. So we see some uh, big shifts. Um, there are many problems, of course, still existing, um, big debates on the, on the rollout of the vaccinations. But um, I would say um, the, the anecdote or the event shows us that when there is a will, there's also also away in the European Union. So what's often missing is actually still the will. Thank you. Uh, and I do remember reality bites. <laughs> <laughs> right. Ethan Hawke, went on a writer. Um, moving on, I'd like to focus more specifically uh, on, on Brexit and uh, the gears that were turning behind Brexit. Uh, so now that it's, it's pretty much a fait accompli, what exactly is different now about the EU-UK relationship? Uh, what exactly has changed uh, now that there's there's no point of of going back? There's no no return. I'd like to turn first to uh, Ozum. Um, Ozum, how exactly does your work on framing apply to the British referendum? Thank you. Um, in the Brexit referendum, you might everybody might remember that most academics, policymakers, everyone assumed that the majority of British citizens would vote to remain in the EU, and this was due to the idea that voters prefer to stay uncertainty and they tend to avoid economic costs and the opinion polls show the critically split public but the main expectation was that the status quo bias would motivate enough voters for a tight result in favor of remaining in the EU and in a recent book with uh, Richard Nadeau and Eric Belanger we actually argued that the answer to the puzzle was again about fr framing um, through the campaign framing, politicians redefined what Brexit would mean for the public and whether remaining or leaving would be riskier. And voting against the status quo in that sense was made easier for that critical section of the society because the pro-leave argument strongly suggested that remaining would be at least as risky as leaving it. To give you examples, the leave side proposed their own figures on the economic costs of a Remain vote, famously suggesting that the UK was paying 350 million to the EU budget per week. The Leave campaign also successfully brought new risks, new issues to the agenda, arguing that there would be risks to remaining in the EU, such as losing control of migration policy or the NHS. And they vividly argued that the um, public should take back control these concrete and quite emotional arguments struck an immediate chord with the voters and the Remain side was interestingly silent on these issues without an emotional case to present. And so looking at, let's say, uh, the realm of trade and new agreements, um, Michelle, the TCA, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, 
what exactly does this new agreement cover and uh, what's missing from it going forth? I think people were anticipating in December, it had to be done. There was a real push right at the end to get some form of trade agreement rather than no deal. And it was pushed through Parliament in one day. It's still being examined by the Europeans in the European Parliament, so they're giving it a lot more scrutiny. What does it include? It's mostly going to make sure that Britain is no longer part of the single market, no longer part of the customs union at a third country. Most of the trade agreement is on tariffs and goods. There's very little on services, which is where Britain has a comparative advantage, actually. So nothing really on financial services, not, you know, there's discussions about data flows and so forth. And it'll be reviewed five years after entry in force now. And foreign policy and defense cooperation were not included at the express wishes of the UK. And one also has to remember it's a lot about trade. It's a lot about making sure that trade flows happen. But there's also some cooperation in criminal law and judicial and law enforcement. Right now, it's a work in progress. Anybody watching the news has seen a lot of the glitches and the stoppages at the border and we'll know that this needs to be effectively implemented to work properly. So uh, there are you know, some talk of uh, some dark clouds on the horizon. Um, so if we look more specifically at the EU-UK trade relationship, Jörg, what exactly does Brexit mean for the future of this trade relationship in particular? How is it going to play out? So I think most importantly is there are no clean slates despite the divorce. Uh, what like also Dirk uh, said earlier, uh, interdependencies are uh, strong within the European Union and they will remain in place between the UK and the Euro UK, uh, Euro European Union as well. So uh, building a little bit on what Michelle said, maybe on a more general level, in the literature on European integration, we distinguish two types or dimensions of, Euro of economic integration. One is called negative integration, which is not means negative in the negative sense, but it just means we create a space for markets by uh, reducing or, or removing any uh, trade barriers uh, to enhance the exchange and transaction of goods and, and maybe also service, etc. So this is on the good side, like uh, more or less accomplished as Michelle just said. On the other hand, we have so-called positive integration, which means we need to re-regulate the market to facilitate market exchanges, especially in a more complex uh, environment where you have uh, supply chains, etc. Uh, but also to mitigate negative externalities from market exchanges. And this is more or less very weak. It has always been a, an asymmetry within the European Union between negative and positive, but in the relationship between the UK and uh, the European Union now, it's really asymm asymmetrical. So uh, the main challenge now is over the next couple of years to recalibrate this relationship a little bit again, to work strongly on the positive integration side, uh, to make this market somehow uh, working again, especially in these areas uh, that are outside the realm of goods and services. I would say, though, that it's maybe a little bit easier now uh, because the UK is now a separate unit, a third country, more or less, and uh, positive integration requires a lot of uh, political legit legit legitimacy. So uh, this will maybe be a little bit easier now than it has been over the last nine months or even longer if you take the longer negotiation period. So there are some significant changes uh, that will occur, and this will obviously impact the way that decisions are made. Um, so, Dirk, what exactly is the most important impact of Brexit for EU decision making? And is there anything that could actually be positive about Brexit? Well, let me first express my regret, of course. Um, that's um, a very bad thing that happened um, with Brexit, and it's um, really been um, a, a tremendous shock um, to entire Europe. So that includes um, the UK and the, uh, the rest of Europe, including uh, the European Union member states. But um, again, I'm coming back to my reality. So we have to live with uh, political realities. And um, so if you ask me what's positive, um, 
I guess um, I become a Brexiteer now uh, answering your question or uh, going back to Alan uh, um, Sket, the founder of UKIP in the 1990s, um, that competition is something that can enhance um, the quality of political system as it can enhance the quality of, of businesses. So um, when you think about the vaccination race, um, that really hurts uh, again to see the UK who has uh, not uh, been doing, uh, excuse uh, me, uh, not uh, all to a, a brilliant job in, in fighting COVID uh, during uh, the past year, which is now moving far beyond the European Union. So um, the European Union has to ask what's going on. Why didn't we um, uh, are, put ourselves into a position uh, to have a better vaccination rate? Um, so that's just one example where I think um, the UK can, can sort of trigger um, some sort of um, um, competition on the decision-making part of the question. And that might also be related to um, this uh, normative evaluation of being something positive is um, um, that the UK um, has um, been described as an awkward partner inside the European Union. And um, it's often been on the brakes um, with uh, future steps to enlargement, um, uh, to, um, uh, to further integration, not to enlargement, but to um, a deepening of European Union integration. And um, I think um, uh, Germany has uh, shifted more into the center, um, also into the center of the policy space. Space. Um, so uh, it uh, can now not uh, any more hide behind the UK, which has been uh, more reluctant um, uh, towards um, uh, further integration. And uh, my hunch would be that um, the Franco-German couple will play um, a more important role and can possibly push integration a little bit uh, more forward. So with things like uh, the vaccination rates, trade barriers, migration flows and issues, uh, it does the question of how resilient the union is. Um, so I'd like to pose the question of can the union be reimagined or does it even need to be? Uh, so I'll start with Oslo. Um, in one of your books, Oslo, Framing the European Union, you analyze six referendums from five different European countries and you explain that the public generally supported referendum proposals before political campaigns started, but in some cases this support actually diminished substantially. So why does this take place in some referendums and not in others? Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting case, really. The picture was quite similar to the one in Brexit, so I will be saying similar things. These six referendums that I looked at had such puzzling results because you might remember that the EU had a federalist moment in early 2000s and drafted a European constitution. And many member states decided to give the public a direct say on it. But the result was quite a shock because Spain and Luxembourg approved it, but then France and the Netherlands rejected it. And the EU shelved the constitutional treaty, but then a couple of years later, it came back as the Treaty of Lisbon. And this time on the Ireland had to vote on it in a referendum, they rejected it. And then they approved it within a year in a repeat referendum. So it was really fascinating. And when we look at it, there's again a picture that is quite, um, quite similar to what I was saying at the, with the Brexit case, the main reason I find was the existence of a strategic anti-EU campaign. Because all cases started with a general pro-treaty feeling, but this was weakened in cases where we witnessed a very strong anti-EU campaign. To give you examples, pro-EU arguments, highlighting abstract benefits or technical issues, pretty much lost in the face of anti-EU arguments, suggesting that, for example, Turkey would join the EU if the constitution passed, or that the country would lose its national identity if the constitution passed. I'm not saying that all anti-EU arguments were misleading. There were many accurate and really important ones concerning the loss of certain voting arrangements or effects of certain economic policies. But there was an important dynamic that was quite imbalanced between the pro and anti-EU sides. And in the repeat referendum in Ireland, I found that the first referendum closely resembled the French, Dutch and Brexit referendums. But what changes in the second round was that the pro-EU side worked to the EU and obtained guarantees on the themes of the first referendum. And that really helped to neutralize the ground and the anti-EU uh, concerns. And so, Dirk, in your view, is the idea of differentiated integration going to increase in the coming years? And why are people so divided about differentiated uh, integration? Well, let me start with the last um, question. Why are they so divided? I think what comes up in people's mind, but we're still actually trying to get 
to understand what people actually think about the issue of differentiated integration. But what I can say as of now is that they have two um, core thoughts in the, the heads. One is concerning fairness. So the, the interesting question of um, differentiated integration for me, and I think for many others, is, is really who's blackmailing whom here? Who's dominating whom in differentiated integration? Is it Hungary and Poland um, that sort of stopped um, the, um, the passage of the next generation EU? Um, and um, that was then being, because it didn't want to uh, join um, the um, rule of law mechanism, so it would have liked to have an opt-out and the others didn't want to give an opt-out in this respect. And, um, or is it uh, the others that sort of push um, uh, these countries into accepting values um, that they don't uh, want to actually share or they say they, they want to uh, do things differently. The second one is really, um, what does it mean for your country? So will it put us into a worse situation? Will we be discriminated against or will it actually allow us to do something or to uh, get out of something um, where we don't want to take uh, part? And um, in our research, we can show that um, there's really um, liberal oriented um, citizens, so economically liberal oriented citizens, they think um, uh, differentiated integration is a good thing. Those uh, who stick more to equality, also to political equality, they're more opposed to differentiated integration, we see a clear difference between the North that is largely in favor of differentiated integration and the South um, that is uh, uh, quite strongly opposed and um, our hunch is that is uh, still a repercussion of the Eurozone crisis uh, that uh, they have a concern of uh, being um, discriminated against. Now, um, the second question of yours quickly, um, uh, how will it proceed in the future? I would think, um, given of what I've said already, um, the conference on the future of Europe, uh, which will be sort of paving the way possibly to future EU reforms. I mean, this is uh, an entire big topic, um, is uh, geared towards more inclusiveness. Uh, that would be uh, my hunch um, that it'll not uh, sort of pave the way for um, uh, promoting differentiation, but I think the time is more ripe right now to sort of move into a direction jointly, but that's just a, uh, a hopefully well-informed guess. Well, it seems that, uh, as you mentioned, norms, identities, and relationships uh, are changing quite substantially. Um, so, York, how exactly does the Brexit deal reconfigure relationships between the EU and the UK? Yeah, thanks. Also, uh, of thinking about this question in, in terms of the overall question of the EU's resilience, um, I, I would generally say that the EU is much more resilient and has been much more resilient than many people would acknowledge. And I think in the cur current situation, um, it is it looks quite favorable actually for the EU to re-emerge out of this crisis uh, in a, even with an even stronger role. Let me just make three short points. The first is Bre Brexit related. Uh, Brexit is, of course, a relief, and it also signals something to other countries. It is painful, it is costly, and it's maybe not, not something that we want to pursue. And that holds for both those countries who are in the Eurozone, but also those who are not part of the Eurozone, like I'm thinking about Hungary and others, who, by the way, also benefit a lot. And there is quite some support for EU membership. So I think this is good. Second, if we take the coincidence of Brexit and the current situation, the COVID crisis and the critical juncture that it has triggered, I think this is also a moment for the EU. Um, I think Dirk earlier mentioned the recovery fund. This is a, an important innovation. That's an important new fiscal tool that will strengthen the EU's fiscal capacity because they have some say now in how they will uh, reallocate or redistribute the money among European member states. And that gives them some power. Also, uh, future-wise, if we think about uh, bonding or um, um, issu issuing new debts, etc. So th this is a new uh, important tool that the European Union has actually been craving for for quite some time. Now they got it. Uh, and third, also, if we take a look at the international stage here with the Biden administration on the one hand and the European Union on the other hand, uh, there's China on the horizon. So this uh, will perhaps marginalize, uh, maybe that's not the wrong word, but like there's a stronger role for the European Union and maybe uh, the, the Biden administration on the international stage at the expense of Britain. So in other words, this idea of a global Britain, which was uh, one of the important selling points a couple of years ago, is maybe not as strong uh, as, it, as it used to be five years ago anymore. 
Well, we can talk about Brexit, uh, the EU and changing relationships uh, in terms of the status of the union without bringing up Northern Ireland. Uh, so, Michelle, what exactly is the status of Northern Ireland and uh, why was it treated differently in the final withdrawal agreement? Well, going back to Dirk's comment that what we've ended up with is differentiated integration within the UK because Northern Ireland is now treated differently than the rest of the United Kingdom. And the way I would argue it is that Northern Ireland is literally caught between two unions. On the one hand, it's part of an economic union, i.e. a single market customs union, because there was no, they didn't want a land border between North and South because that would violate the Good Friday Peace Agreement of 1998. But on the other hand, it's part of a political sovereign union of the United Kingdom, subject to, you know, British rules and issues related to sovereignty. So it's caught between two different unions. And um, the problem is, is that to resolve this issue, um, the withdrawal agreement created this special Northern Ireland protocol which is in place and can be reevaluated four years from now to see how it's going. And, you know, is this an acceptable solution to the Good Friday peace agreement, no land border in Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland being allowed to then trade more freely uh, in the EU single market. The problem goes to what Dirk said, which was identities. Identities are really strong in Northern Ireland between those who are nationalists and believe they want to stay with Britain and those who are unionists who would like to see a united Ireland. And they're very polarized politically right now. And what's happening in the last few days is really concerning in terms of violence, peace and stability, because a lot of the unionists feel that so much effort was put into this hard land border to make sure it didn't happen between the north and the south of Ireland, that what's happened is we've created a new trade border, and that's between England, mainland, and Northern Ireland. And that's causing a lot of the friction and tension. This is going to be a issue to watch, and it just wasn't on the radar screen in terms of political opinion and thinking in Whitehall, in Westminster, when Brexit happened. So with the tensions we see, uh, a lot of it does revolve around history, cultures, different identities, and of course the concept of differentiated integration requires difference. Uh, but it seems that one of the main aims of integration was to foster a common European identity uh, that would transcend national identities. So obviously Brexit uh, and the events of the last decade have challenged the assumptions behind this shared cohesive European identity. Um, so going back to you, Michelle, is Brexit really over? Uh, and if not, what might this mean for Europe and the identities attached to it? Gosh, Brexit round one is over and that's getting to the deadline of getting a trade and cooperation agreement. Now round two starts and that's implementing this agreement. Is there enough trust? How much flexibility should there be in these negotiations in terms of implementing it and managing it? So I think where that's where we are. I think we need to separate the trade negotiations from the next steps and implementation. I also think that Europe really is sort of everybody else was indicating has a whole host of issues to deal with beyond Brexit, the next gen digital uh, sustainability rule of law backsliding, it needs to move on. And Johnson as prime minister wants to move on from Brexit. He wants to argue I delivered Brexit, but it's continuing and it's continuing because we're seeing sort of you know, the, the resolution of issues in Northern Ireland and the concerns they have about trade between mainland England, global supply chains, single market, market access. Some of that is teething problems. Some of it's the reality of being outside a customs union in a single market. We're at also an issue of a centennial. It is 1921 was when Ireland was divided. So this is very, you know, to use uh, Uzzams, it's very politically salient and people are bringing up issues of memory, identity and history right now as well. 
So I think one of the big questions floating around uh, policy circles and public circles uh, is the future of Europe and the integration project. Jörg, will Brexit actually weaken or strengthen the European project of integration? So my guess is clearly that it will, uh, there's a good chance that it will strengthen the European Union integration project. Uh, from a historical point of view, European integration has often been described as a new stage of, of the development of the nation state beyond national borders, as a process of center formation where you have Brussels as a new, still weak, but still nevertheless important center that has uh, been able to be very productive in terms of uh, Europeanization and, and uh, like covering the whole range of policies that we can think about, uh, Europe is a factor. So, uh, and that won't go away. The problem with this whole thing is that we still lack this identity, this European identity, but I think it is uh, problematic to think about this as a traditional nation building project, which it will never be. So it's more uh, a question of loyalties. How can loyalties be generated and attached to this project? And here, I think one, one aspect that is really interesting to looking at the European Union from a Canadian perspective, I mean, Canada shows uh, that uh, a multinational state uh, is possible. Uh, identities here are fragile, but they are also there and they are overlapping. Uh, if you think about Quebec, but also about indigenous communities, uh, about pro provincial versus federal loyalties. So it's a highly complicated thing. And especially if you also look at different publics, public spheres in Quebec are more or less detached from public spheres in, in the rest of Canada. But nevertheless, there were mechanisms, or have, there have been mechanisms in place that somehow facilitated uh, exchanges and, and, and creating loyalty, at least to some extent. The second point, uh, very quickly, what is very interesting and in the report that came out earlier this week from the European Union on the social dimension of Europe. And I found this very uh, illuminating in a certain way. Um, it was a larger poll that has been undertaken in late 2020 about the, uh, the European pillar of social rights. And what you find here is that there's a very strong support among Europeans uh, to strengthen the, the social dimension of Europe and especially this uh, social pillar. Well, just one number is nearly eight or 88 percent say that say that uh, social Europe is important to them personally. The only problem that comes with this is that only a third of the population of the respondents said they knew about the, uh, the social pillar of the European Union. So that's maybe the main problem the European Union needs to think about more, more thoroughly. Well, we can't have uh, any democratic elections or referendums without having a, a public that thinks in one way or another. So opinion factors into this, right? How are the opinions of the populace in the, the UK and the EU shaped? And so, Oslem, turning to your work, how exactly is the power of political argumentation or the uh, framing of Brexit really relevant for other EU member states right now? In a nutshell, the, I can say that no member state is immune to such framing dynamics. Even when countries have strong pro-EU sentiments, strategic anti-EU frames could cause an episodic dip and the EU can easily become a target of contention. To take an interesting example, in the early to mid 2000s, scholars were arguing that it would be hard to find an effective anti-EU narrative in Central and Eastern Europe, looking at the 2003 EU accession referendums. And in these countries, EU membership was viewed as a symbol of transition from post-totalitarian dictatorship to liberal democracy, and this rendered anti-EU campaign, anti campaigning difficult. But today, when we look at certain countries such as Poland and Hungary, we can see that anti-EU frames are quite strong, particularly on the issue of national sovereignty. And as Michelle and Jörg have already mentioned, what we're talking about here is really the political communication of an essential trade-off in today's globalizing world, the benefits of economic integration, on the one hand and the loss of national decision-making power on the other. So in an increasingly interdependent world, there will be more referendums surely asking for the public support for further international cooperation. And until what point can integration projects ask its members to give up national autonomy is a good question. Another important question is, is the public genuinely having a shift of values and turning its back on globalization or is this an apparent shift a matter of framing? This is why the questions we are raising through the study of Brexit are quite important for other EU member states as well. 
Well, I know if there's one thing Brexit shows us, it's the power of public opinion and uh, the differences of the opinion uh, opinions within any member state of the EU or otherwise. But something that definitely brings us all together as we're finding right now is the fact we were all thinking, living, breathing human beings, and we're all uh, we're all running from the elephant in the room, which is COVID-19. Um, so Dirk, tell us what you believe shapes European solidarity right now, especially during this time of COVID-19. Yeah. I mean, what has been said by Uslam is, is interesting, or what you've sort of made of Uslam's comment um, relating to the UK vis-a-vis -vis the rest. I think there's um, certainly a, a larger majority inside the UK that is opposed to the European Union, but there's, of course, uh, many people, many citizens in other countries who, who very much feel the same. Um, the, the, it might not be um, distributed to the same extent, but that's certainly something that we need to uh, take into, into account. Now, on your question, a proper of European solidarity. Um, two things. Um, now, when we look at this vaccination issues, um, it strikes me as interesting that we don't see more disputes inside the European Union. I mean, this is really a crucial, very, very costly matter. And um, people are criticizing the European Commission. They're criticizing um, their, um, their um, uh, national states or the, the, the regions for, for the rollout, et cetera. But they're not really contesting um, the decision to move um, into the vaccination together. And I think that's, um, that's sort of surprising. Uh, we did a research uh, last year in Germany um, asking about 8,000 people about um, deservingness um, of um, European aid um, during COVID. And we asked about um, medical aid and solidarity and financial. And um, clearly, we found that the large majority was in favor of um, granting medical aid, um, such as ventilators or face masks or whatever to European uh, fellow citizens outside uh, of Germany in need. Um, there was um, less um, uh, readiness um, concerning financial help. So we do see that the need um, dimension seems to play out. We in fact tested um, different dimensions that we know um, are driving heuristics um, of, um, of um, solidarity inside the welfare state. And we do find very similar um, uh, effects um, which again shows us that we might, I agree with you, we are not a, a nation state, obviously, but we're moving um, into this direction. So um, they cared about um, control. Um, so was a country actually, um, uh, was it its own responsibility of being in need or not? Um, attitudes um, seem to matter. Um, so if a country is sticking to the rule of law, it is uh, more ready uh, to be accepted um, uh, to as a, as a recipient of aid. Um, we saw that at least the, the German citizens that we inquired um, reacted to whether a country was ready to accept refugees. So that was something of a solidarity reciprocity uh, mechanism. And finally, identity also matters. Also those who feel more European, and that's coming back to the starting of my answer, um, are more ready to um, uh, give um, aid. A complex mix of uh, solidarity and difference for sure. Um, yeah. Now I'm going to uh, ask everyone to put on, uh, I guess, their, their lenses, their glasses that can look into the future, put on uh, their hats that can, I don't know, help them gaze into a crystal ball. And I'm going to ask about the future. I want everyone's assessment of the future. So what, what exactly is the UK's future and what is Europe's future? It's, uh, I think, the question on everyone's mind. So, Michelle, starting with you um, and starting with the UK, Going forward, how exactly can it balance uh, cross pressures from the United States and the EU on various global governance issues from trade to alliances to security uh, and, and other aspects of the relationship? Uh, it's a great big question and a million dollar one. Um, I would turn around, let me just pick framing trade-offs and cooperation as some of the themes. Um, the first issue on trade, how the UK navigates between the EU and how they set rules and standards and norms on trade and the United States might come down to a lot of framing and concerns about quality, food safety, public health and so forth. So that might be one way of thinking about it. A second way might be to think about this in terms of trade-offs. Now the UK and post-Brexit maybe there'll be an opportunity for closer defense integration because the UK has been a bit of a break on closer integration in the past. 
And so, or it might be a net loss because the UK is a big defense spender. So you can have a trade-off here in terms of, um, you know, the, the future. The third area might be to think about areas, because this issue has been so controversial and full of friction, to think about areas of cooperation. And here, um, you know, both the UK and the EU are thinking about an Indo-Pacific strategy. Maybe they might bring the EU and UK to closer together or the EU and the US, so to speak, or it might accentuate differences. I think we also need to sort of move beyond this rhetoric to think about areas of cooperation. COPs and climate change is gonna be in the UK. It's important, the Biden administration back in Paris climate, you know, the EU being sort of very concerned about sustainability. We've also got to think about areas of cooperation rather than this continuous friction that we've been seeing over the last few years. So York, looking into your own crystal ball, uh, what does Brexit mean for the future of Europe more generally? So I'm, I'm a political scientist and not an historian, but I like to look at these questions through a historical lens and uh, by way of stylizing things a little bit, I would say, again, as I said earlier, we are in a critical juncture situation. That's a, a rare situation where we see many things uh, actually clear, or at least they, they're, 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 they bring these situations, bring things into sharper focus. And I think one, one way to see, look at these things is uh, that the old market-based order that really came up in the 80s and was advanced by the European Union uh, is vulnerable at the moment. And it has been vulnerable for quite some time. We saw this in 2007 and 8, but there was not a real response to that. And what I see now at the moment is there are two large narratives. And the one is the narrative of the great reset or the great rebuilding, a cleaner, more equitable economy. On the other hand, is this take back control idea uh, that was somehow represented by Brexit. Uh, so now we won't see either or. Uh, it will be an amalgamation of things, of course. Uh, but I, I am more optimistic on the optimistic side. I think there is a strong case to make for that we will see uh, maybe a slightly new order emerging that is uh, rooted on maybe slightly different principles than the old ones. Um, and uh, how this materializes in practice is also that we will see uh, an interesting um, yeah, form of differentiated integration where you have like uh, the European Union on the one hand and then other countries in different ways attached through formal agreements, be it uh, free trade agreements or other economic uh, agreements. Uh, and there are many different models out there. If you think about the, the Norway model on the one hand, the Switzerland model on the other hand, or like Canada and the EU through CETA. So this is, I think, what we will be seeing. But I th also believe that an important policy idea that will uh, emerge as more important and more salient is really like uh, more equity uh, um, uh, tackling climate change, a greener economy. And there's overlap between the UK and the European Union as well, by the way. You close off on, on some nice, easily accomplishable goals, right? <laughs> Going forward, it, it seems like there's a, the discussions over Brexit always boil down to a yes or no, for or against, and it, it boils down to communication and framing. Um, so Oslin, looking forward into the future, how might these dynamics of framing the issues affect the future of the EU? And right now, does the EU have a communications problem or a framing problem? I think so, yes. In arguing for and against the EU, politicians who opt for a certain kind of language tend to have an advantage over others, and voters are inclined to prefer simple answers over complex answers, and that's where the EU really has a communication problem because it is quite complex. And it's really difficult to have strong, in the way I described, strong arguments on complex and nuanced issues. The EU is based on the idea of compromise and that does not lend itself very well to quick discussions. For example, in the Remain um, campaign, in the Brexit referendum, there was no clear answer to the slogan, take back control, as you just mentioned, or to the arguments on migration. And what's really interesting is that while the economic aspect of globalization, you know, the economic advantages or disadvantages of the EU or any international trade agreement lend, lends itself reasonably well to debate, the autonomy aspect, the advantages or disadvantages of pooling sovereignty doesn't. In other words, campaigners do not seem 
to have difficulty in generating economic arguments when they're arguing for and against um, in international cooperation schemes. But when it comes to arguments on losing national autonomy, only the side that is against international cooperation or against the EU appears to be vocal. And for the EU, really the pro-EU camp will need to be more proactive than reactive, more positive than defensive, more clear than vague, and overall more emotional and creative in making a case for furthering um, the integration project. So right now we're obviously uh, experiencing a series of crises that we discussed at the outset, um, COVID-19 being one of them. And so Dirk, returning to, uh, I suppose, the previous question in a way, COVID-19 has obviously been spreading turmoil around the world, um, but in the expectation that things will improve uh, in the next year uh, in the UK and beyond, do you believe that the actual experience of COVID uh, may become an opportunity for the EU or uh, EU integration going forth? Yeah, this is good. I think we got to really tie uh, in uh, Michelle Siok and Aslam's um, comments here into into a new narrative. And I think what's um, really become clear in um, the COVID crisis and that really distinguishes the COVID crisis from the Eurozone crisis is uh, that um, here we really have uh, an awareness um, of, uh, of a community of states being jointly affected by a, a health shock and by an economic shock. And um, if you compare the rhetorics, uh, the, the framing and the fault attribution logics that have been displaced, um, displayed uh, during COVID uh, with the ones during the Eurozone crisis, where it's all the, the lazy southerners um, who, who, who gaspillated uh, the, the money and didn't um, uh, do uh, solid economies and the north, uh, the, the saintly north uh, had to pay. Um, that was the discourse uh, very simplified um, at the time and now we see a very different discourse and I think that's um, the, the a way to look forward and uh, my hunch would be um, that it is uh, not anymore um, an immoral thing to talk about a more uh, distributive justice inside of the European Union and um, that'll be um, um, meaning uh, that'll be uh, more redistribution necessary and somebody needs to pay and it'll be the citizens of the north um, and I think um, the, the politicians have realized in the north not all of them but um, we still know about the frugal four but we see a tendency of um, being ready to sort of um, engage in a new narrative that may pave the way um, for a deeper integration, but that must come at the price um, of more um, normative integration. So um, that was exactly the problem in autumn uh, when uh, the, it was the debate about money. If you want to pay more, the Netherlands, they want uh, uh, protection of the, the rule of law, uh, democracy, etc. You can't get one without the other. And that again underlines to me uh, that we're staying at a crossroads here that it might be a turning point of a, a deeper European integration lying ahead of us. Excellent. Well, five years from now, we're going to review this, this video and uh, see how accurate everyone's uh, future anticipations or guesses are. So thank you very much for staring into the crystal ball there. Um, we actually have just enough time for a question or two from the audience. So I'll kindly ask our panelists uh, if you could limit your responses to kind of a lightning round, like 30 seconds to a minute. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Um, so the first question here, um, it is from Chris, and it's to what extent can we say that Brexit was a culmination of reactionary politics to globalization? Uh, so why don't we start with Oslem, and then we'll go to uh, Dirk, Jorg, uh, and then Michelle. Thank you. I, I think this is a great question, and I think I did allude to a similar pattern in my answers too. So I agree that this is related to reactionary politics to globalization. But I think it is a combination of both long-term and short-term factors. So I would say, yes, it's the long-term reaction to certain patterns, but with specific framings that were present to awaken that feeling. Thank you, Dirk. Yes, my answer is very short. Yes, that's true. All right. Uh, so, it's I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> no, the... Uh, we, we see that it's uh, it's concerns that we see in the literature. Um, so it's economic and it's um, uh, non-economic identity related issues. And uh, they come together very strongly. And um, the European Union is not a blame, uh, to blame for the, the large percentage of Pakistanis in, in certain areas or the, the economic decline in, in, in parts of Wales. Um, so we see um, this is really larger developments that drive such processes. And um, yeah, so yes. Excellent, thank you. And York. 
Yes, also just echoing, I mean, the literature talks about a new transnational cleavage here. Uh, it's not just a UK thing, it's a more general phenomenon. Uh, and that has gained uh, a significant importance over the last 20 years uh, or so. So yes, for sure. Thank you. And uh, Michelle, your thoughts? Just very quickly, um, this was about the politics of grievance as well. And I think it's a much to use uh, Jörg's phrase, we got to look at history. This just didn't happen 2016. This has been happening of decades of deindustrialization. The one issue and aspect to think about in context of Brexit here is the, the fact that Britain has an unbalanced economy. And we tend to forget that the city of London and London has the larger percentage and economic growth, and it's the outside regions that voted for Brexit. So that unbalanced economy due to globalization contributed to this, yes. Thank you. And so for our final question, uh, we have a lot of policymakers in the audience, both uh, international and within Canada. Uh, so I'd like to ask every panelist to give a quick kind of Twitter friendly line or two as to recommendations they have to policymakers concerning the topic of Brexit. Uh, so we'll start with Dirk, then we'll go to Oslem, then Michelle, and we'll finish with Jorg. So Dirk, your policy uh, recommendations to policymakers, please. Very short, deliver to the people. Barry Eichengreen has uh, showed in his uh, fabulous book on the populist temptation, uh, where he covers the period from um, nine, uh, 19th and 20th century, um, that the only really good recipes against populism and um, dissatisfaction, um, so lack of system support, is good policies that make people's lives easier, happier, and healthier. So that's Sorry. certainly the way forward. So deliver to the people. Okay, uh, Oslo, your recommendations to policymakers. I think I will recommend more citizen assemblies. So because I think to, to me, the problem looks like we're at the moment either having the EU as a non-issue or then we jump into a really politicized period with a heated debate. And the problem then is just the limited deliberation, even misinformation. And that's really difficult to debunk as it's happening. So I think the EU really needs more contestation, actually, more criticism, more discussion. Um, and at, that needs to happen on a today basis for everyone to better understand the dynamics at work. Thank you. And Michelle, your message to policymakers. Brexit highlighted that they didn't want to think about experts, I would say, A, you need to listen to experts, B, you need to listen to those on the ground dealing with the day-to-day -day implications and impact of leaving the single market, and three, um, I would really have concerns about what's going on in Northern Ireland, and I would really like to see us dial down the rhetoric and focus on flexibility in implementation to make this work. Excellent. And Jörg, finish us off. Your last uh, recommendations to policymakers on Brexit. Three very short, quick points. So the first one, as a political scientist, I always thought political leadership is something like a residual category. When we can't explain something, then we refer to political leadership. I changed my mind. It's really important. Political leadership matters a lot, I think. That's what we've learned in a critical juncture situation, even more so than, than, than in normal times. Second, uh, if you're not from Canada, take a look at Canada. Uh, don't be afraid of pragmatic and asymmetrical solutions. And uh, the third one is really think creati creatively about like how to, to um, engage with this great reset. There are fantastic um, ideas out there. The economy of the, of the common good, for example, uh, has interesting ideas as to how we can reorganize capitalism in a way that it eventually delivers, as Dirk just said. Excellent. Well, I'd like to thank all the panelists uh, for their time today. I'm sure you'll agree it was a, a great discussion and it was a lot of fun, despite obviously um, the severity of uh, what we're facing with, with Brexit and the EU. Uh, so we hope that you enjoyed participating. And uh, to the audience, we hope you enjoyed it as well. We hope you can join us next week when we take a look at Iran's nuclear weapons program and we ask, can it be contained? So until then, thank you to everyone. Take care. Stay safe. Bye-bye.